His Excellency Rajesh Prasad, my very good friend from college all those years ago. Good to see you here, and thank you for your kind words. Professor Thusu, Professor Sparks, Ambassador Navdeep Suri, Dr. Mota. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I hope that covers everybody. Um, I, I really, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat embarrassed to be standing before all of you here because I suspect you've all uh, spent as much time thinking about soft power as I have. Indeed, uh, I just looked at the notes for this meeting and discovered a reference to my quote unquote, much viewed TED talk on the same subject. And if it is indeed much viewed by many of you in the audience, you will hear some of the same ideas at somewhat greater length. So I seek apologies in advance, but there will be a few additional thoughts, I hope, as we go along. Um, what sparked off my initial reflection on this subject, which I have been writing and speaking about now for three or four years, is the increasing focus at the beginning of the 21st century on India's rising power in conventional terms, our consistent economic growth in the last couple of decades, which has prompted so many to speak of India as a future world leader, or even as the next superpower. These are quotes from, from assorted international commentators. In fact, the American publishers of my 2007 book, The Elephant, the Tiger, and the Cell Phone, even added a gratuitous subtitle suggesting that my volume was about the emerging 21st century superpower. India, assorted commentators claim, is heading irresistibly for great power status as, and I use the words again, a world leader in the new century. Now, I have a real problem with that term because the notion of world leadership is a curiously archaic one. The very phrase is redolent of Kipling ballads and James Bondian adventures. What makes a country a world leader? If it's population, then fine, we are on course to top the charts because uh, India will overtake China, the UN estimates, in 2034 as the world's most populous country. If it's military strength, well, we are only uh, the fourth largest army in the world. I think we have no plans to be any larger. Uh, nuclear capacity, well, we're one of several, as you know, but we have made our status clear in 1998, and that's been formally recognized now by the Nuclear Suppliers Group. If it's economic development, well, there, of course, we have made extraordinary strides in recent years. Uh, already the world's largest, fifth, la fifth largest economy in purchasing power parity terms and continuing to climb. Um, though too many of our people still live destitute amidst despair and disrepair. Or should what we are talking about be a combination of all of these allied to something altogether more difficult to define? It's soft power. And that's what brings us to the themes of today. Now, as I said, much of the conventional analyses of India's stature uh, in the world relies on these very familiar economic assumptions. But we are famously a land of paradoxes. And amongst those paradoxes is that so many speak about India as a great power of the 21st century when we are not yet able to feed, educate, and employ all our people. So it's not, therefore, economic growth, military strength, or population numbers that I would underscore when I think of India's potential role, a leadership role or otherwise, in the world of the 21st century. Rather, if there is one attribute of independent India to which I think increasing attention should be paid around the globe. And that's why I'm glad that Professor Thusu has doggedly pursued the idea of this, of this gathering for a year now. It is this quality that, as we've already heard from the first couple of introductory speeches, India is already displaying in ample measure today its soft power. Now, we've already heard uh, references to and quotes from my good friend uh, Joseph Nye of Harvard, who first articulated this theory, so I won't repeat it, but just to underscore a couple of aspects of it. Nye wrote about soft power essentially as the ability to alter the behavior of others to get what you want. And of course, there are three ways to do that. There's payments, carrots. There's coercion, sticks. And there's attraction, soft power. If you're able to attract others, you can economize on the sticks and the carrots. And that was Nye's argument. Now, traditionally, at least before Nye gave an articulation to this concept, power was always seen as hard power. Uh, the, the idea was the side with the larger army, the bigger military, the more muscle, including, of course, economic and military muscle, the side with the larger army was always likely to win. But as Nye, I think, observed, um, even in the past, that wasn't necessarily so, because obviously the U.S. lost the Vietnam War, and it was the world's uh, one of two in those, cases, in those days superpowers. The Soviet Union was defeated in Afghanistan, and uh, the U.S. also discovered 
post Nai, in the first few years after its successful occupation of Baghdad, uh, the limitations of hard power, because as uh, Iraq taught them, uh, it was the wisdom of Talleyrand's old adage that the one thing you can't do with a bayonet is to sit on it. So clearly, you needed something more than hard power if you wanted to lead, if you wanted to get your way. And that's where soft power came in as a concept, both as an alternative to hard power and as a complement to it. And if I'll quote Nai for the last time, and I'm quoting now, uh, reading from him, the soft power of a country rests primarily on three resources, its culture in places where it's attractive to others, its political values when it lives up to them at home and abroad, and its foreign policies when they're seen as legitimate and having moral authority. Unquote. Now, I'd go slightly beyond this myself. A country's soft power, to me, emerges from the world's perceptions of what that country is all about. The associations and attitudes conjured up in the global imagination by the mere mention of a country's name is often a more accurate gauge of its soft power than a dispassionate analysis of its policies, foreign or domestic. Because in my view, hard power is exercised. Soft power is evoked. Now, from Nye, of course, especially in his first book, the US was the archetypal exponent of soft power. And I think it's difficult to disagree. The fact is that the US is the home of both Boeing and Intel, of Google and the iPod, of Microsoft and MTV, of Hollywood and Disneyland, of McDonald's and Starbucks. In fact, uh, in short, most of the major products that dominate daily life around the globe have emerged from the US. So the attractiveness of these assets and of the American lifestyle of which they're emblematic is that they permit the US to persuade others to adopt the US agenda, rather than relying purely on the dissuasive or coercive hard power of military force. Now, of course, this can cut both ways. In a world of instant mass communications, enabled by the internet, countries are increasingly judged by a global public fed on an incessant diet of internet news, televised images, videos taken on the cell phones of passers-by, email gossip. The steep decline in America's image and standing after 9-11 is a direct reflection of global distaste for the instrument of American hard power, the Iraq invasion, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, torture, rendition, black water, and so on. So the outpouring of goodwill for Washington in the wake of 9-11, think of Lamont's famous assertion, we're all Americans now, and it's squandering, some would argue, by America's over-reliance on hard power in the invasion and occupation of Iraq and the related global war on terror are instructive. The existing soft power assets of the US clearly proved inadequate to compensate for the deficiencies of its hard power approach. Fans of American culture were not prepared to overlook the excesses of Guantanamo. Using Microsoft Windows does not predispose you in favor of extraordinary rendition. Indeed, uh, it can even go the other way. I mean, you, you, these mass demonstrators outside US embassies as the old soul goes, were probably shouting, Yankee, go home and take me with you. Because they would love to partake of that culture. That doesn't mean they agree with the policies. Uh, so the, the use or misuse of hard power can undermine your soft power around the world. But we're not here to talk about the US. And certainly, it is fair to point out that in this follow-up book, The Paradox of American Power, and I took the analysis of soft power well beyond the US and suggested that other nations could also acquire it. Um, and he, he talked about. I said I would quote him for one last time, but this is the one last time, I apologize. He talked about three types of countries that are likely to gain soft power and so succeed, and I quote, those whose dominant cultures and ideals are closer to prevailing global norms. In fact, while I'm reading this quote, which is obviously nigh, I'd like you to think about India as well as the US when you think of these three points. Those whose dominant cultures and ideals are closer to prevailing global norms, which now emphasize liberalism, pluralism, and autonomy, those with the most access to multiple channels of communication and thus have more influence over how issues are framed and those whose credibility is enhanced by their domestic and international performance, unquote. And you can see exactly where I'm coming from, I hope, in leading up to India. Because, of course, at first glance, these three criteria would seem to be a prescription for reaffirming the contemporary reality of US dominance. But, in fact, if you really go back in history, uh, other countries have tried to do quite the same thing. When France lost the 1870 war to Prussia, one of the first things, one of the most important steps they took 
to rebuild the nation's shattered morale and enhance its prestige after the humiliation of defeat and occupation was to create the Alliance Francaise, to spread uh, French language and literature throughout the world as an actual instrument of, of French soft power. And of course, French culture has remained an absolutely crucial selling point for French diplomacy ever since. The UK has a British Council, the Swiss are pro-Helvetia, and Germany, Spain, Italy, and Portugal have respectively institutes named for Goethe, Cervantes, Dante Alighieri, and Camus. Today, China has started establishing Confucius Institutes to promote Chinese culture internationally. And the Beijing Olympics were, of course, a sustained exercise in the building up and display of soft power by an authoritarian state. The US itself has used officially sponsored initiatives from the Voice of America to the Fulbright Scholarships to promote its soft power around the world. But soft power does not merely rely on governmental action. Arguably, for the US, Hollywood and MTV, which have nothing to do with the government, have done more to promote the idea of America as a desirable and admirable society than any US governmental endeavor. Soft power, in other words, is created partly by governments and partly despite governments, partly by deliberate action and partly by accident. So what does this mean for India? It means acknowledging that India's claims, if any, as I said at the beginning, to a significant leadership role in the world in the 21st century, lie in the aspects and products of Indian society and culture that the world finds attractive. These assets may not directly persuade others to support India, but they go a long way toward enhancing India's intangible standing in the world's eyes. The roots of India's soft power, as we've already heard in part this morning, run deep. India's is a civilization that over millennia has offered refuge and more important religious and cultural freedom to Jews, Parsis, several varieties of Christians, and of course Muslims. Jews came to the southwestern Indian coast centuries before Christ. Legend has it that it was after the destruction by the Babylonians of their first temple. There's certainly evidence for their coming after the destruction of the second temple. And what is striking is, of course, that they remain the only example of a Jewish diaspora <coughs> on the planet that did not know a single incident of anti-Semitism in their new homeland until, of course, the Portuguese showed up in the 16th century to inflict it. Christianity arrived on Indian soil with Doubting Thomas, St. Thomas the Apostle, who came to the Malabar coast sometime before 52 AD and was welcomed on shore, or so oral legend has it, by a flute-playing Jewish girl. He made many converts, who, of course, are Indians today, in my state of Kerala, whose ancestors were Christian well before any Europeans ever discovered Christianity. In Kerala, again, where Islam came through traders, travelers, and missionaries in the lifetime of the prophet, rather than by the sword, uh, the Zamorin of Calicut, one of the, the rulers of the, of the area, was so impressed by the seafaring skills of this community, of the Muslim community, that he issued a decree obliging each fisherman's son to bring up one son as a Muslim to man his own Muslim navy. He was convinced only Muslims could sail. Uh, and indeed, one of the, the kings of, of Kerala converted to Islam and embarked on a pilgrimage to Mecca, died there, died on the Arabian Peninsula, but left behind uh, lots of coconut trees. So the reason why there are Kerala coconut trees going, uh, dotting the coastline of, of Oman near Muscat is because of a Kerala king who went there uh, just after the, 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 the passing away of the prophet. Um, the India, in other words, were the whale of the muezzin routinely blends with the chant of the mantras of the Hindu temple, and where the tinkling of church bells accompanies the Sikh Gurdwara's reading of verses from the Guru Granth Sahib, is an India that, freely, that fully embraces the world. In fact, since I'm in London, let me quote the British historian E.P. Thompson, who wrote of this heritage of diversity, that this makes India perhaps the most important country for the future of the world, and I'm quoting here. All the convergent influences of the world, Thompson wrote, run through this society. There is not a thought that is being thought in the East or the West that is not active in some Indian mind. I'm glad a Brit said that and not an Indian. But that Indian mind has been shaped by remarkably diverse forces. Ancient Hindu tradition, myth and scripture, the impact of Islam and Christianity, and two centuries of British colonial rule. The result is unique. Though there are some who think and speak of India as a Hindu country, Indian civilization today is in fact an evolved hybrid of all of these fates and influences. We cannot speak of Indian culture today without Kavali, the poetry of Dalit. For that matter, the game of cricket, our de facto national sport, and uh, one where 
arguably we, we can claim for some years to have been better than the originators of that sport. Mm -hmm. A wonderful Indian sociologist who wrote that uh, cricket clearly is an Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. <laughs> when an Indian uh, dons national dress for a formal event, he wears a variant of the Sherwani, which did not exist before the Muslim invasions of India. Indeed, when Indian Hindus voted recently in a cynical and contrived internet competition to select the new seven wonders of the modern world, they voted for the Taj Mahal constructed by a Mughal king, not for Angkor Wat, the most magnificent architectural product of their religion. In other words, you cannot reduce India's soft power to the impact of Hinduism alone, uh, and in the breadth and not just the depth of its cultural heritage lies uh, this, this uh, soft power. Having said that, I do want to echo the earlier speaker, I think it was Rajesh who mentioned Garuda uh, as Indonesia's uh, national airline, because in fact, coming from the south of India, one is sometimes alarmed by the excessively northern focus on India's uh, cultural influences, because the impact of Indian culture on Southeast Asia, which originated from the south of India many centuries ago, uh, should not be overlooked. Uh, you mentioned uh, Garuda, Rajesh, but in fact, um, the, was, was it you? Was it Daya? I beg your pardon, Daya. Well, the, the best-selling brand of clove cigarillos in Indonesia is called the Ramayana. Uh, that's the actual brand. Uh, in Thailand, which is, of course is staunchly Buddhist and, and very non-vegetarian Buddhist as well, the coronations of the kings are still conducted by Brahmin priests. And in Java, which is over 90% Muslim, uh, it has been for centuries, uh, the Muslims there sport Hindu Sanskritic names. So this curious phenomenon, and now of course we have the revival of Nalanda University, which was the world's greatest university when Oxford and Cambridge were not yet a glint in anybody's eye. Um, Nalanda attracted students from as far afield as Korea, Japan, China, uh, over centuries before its destruction in the late 8th century AD. Uh, and now it's about to be revived with the active cooperation of China, Singapore, and, and other countries. So you, you have a curious, um, neglect, I think, of this aspect of India's soft power and popular consciousness of it. But it's true also that one of the very few generalizations that can be made about India is that nothing can be taken for granted about the country. I mean, not even its name, after all. For the name India comes from the River Indus, which flows in Pakistan. Well, that anomaly is easily enough explained, since what is today Pakistan was hacked off the stooped shoulders of India by the departing British in 47. But I, I make the point that Indian nationalism is a very, very rare phenomenon indeed. Whereas there has been some concern about the nationalistic fervor in China that accompanies any attempt to project its soft power. <laughs> India is a country where we have a nationalism that is not based on any uh, monolithic tendencies. It's not based on language. <coughs> Our constitution recognizes 23, and there are 35, according to the uh, ethno-linguists, that are spoken by more than a million people each, and not to mention 22,000 distinct dialects. It's not based on geography, since the natural geography of the subcontinent, framed by the mountains and the sea, was hacked by the partition of 47. It's not based on ethnicity, since, as we can readily see in this room, the Indian accommodates a diversity of racial types and skin colors. And many Indians, in any case, have something more in common ethnically with so-called foreigners and with other Indians. An Indian Punjabi or an Indian Bengali, for instance, is ethnically kin to a Pakistani and a, Bang and a Bangladeshi rather than with a Punawala or a Bangalorean. So ethnicity is not the basis of nationality either. And nor finally is religion, because we are home to every faith known to mankind, with the possible exception of Shintoism. And Hinduism, a faith without a national organization, no established church or ecclesiastical hierarchy, no Hindu pope, no Hindu mecca, no single sacred book, but many, no uniform beliefs or modes of worship, and not even a Hindu Sunday, exemplifies as much our diversity and our pluralism as it does our common cultural heritage. So Indian nationalism is the nationalism of an idea, the idea of an ever, ever land, if I can borrow from Peter Pan, emerging from an ancient civilization, united by a shared history and sustained by pluralist democracy. Pluralism is a reality made uh, inevitable, perhaps, by our geography, and it's also, of course, been reaffirmed by our history and by our contemporary political we are a land of rich diversities. Uh, I have observed perhaps too often in the past that we are all minorities in India. And this land really imposes no narrow conformities on its citizens. You can be 
many things and one thing. You can be a, a good Muslim, a good Keralite, and a good Indian all at once. So the idea of India, to use Tagore's phrase that has been popularized since, is of one land embracing many. The idea that a nation, nation might endure differences of caste, creed, color, culture, cuisine, conviction, costume, and custom, and still rally around a consensus. But that consensus is around the simple democratic principle that in such a vast and diverse country, you don't really need to agree all the time, so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. Part of the reason, I think, for India's being respected in the world is that it has survived all the stresses and strains that have beset it, and that led so many in the 50s and 60s to predict its imminent disintegration, because it's managed to maintain consensus on how to manage without consensus. Now, the world of the 21st century will increasingly be a world in which the use of hard power carries with it the odium of mass global public disapproval, whereas the blossoming of soft power, which lends itself more easily to the information era, will constitute, in my view, a country's principal asset. Because soft power, after all, is not about conquering others, but about being yourself. Increasingly, countries are judged by the soft power elements they project onto the global consciousness, either deliberately through the product of cultural pro export of cultural products, the cultivation of foreign publics, Navid's job, uh, or even international propaganda, which uh, I'm not a fan of, but also what it does unwittingly through the ways in which a country is perceived as a result of a news story about it in the global mass media. Now, India produces various kinds of culture. We've already had the inevitable reference to Bollywood. I have to admit that as a writer, I, whenever I hear Bollywood, I, I tend to think of the tale of the two goats at the Bollywood garbage dump who are chewing ruminatively on cans of celluloid discarded by a Bollywood <laughs> studio. The first goat chewing away says, hmm, you know, this film is not bad. And the second goat says, no, the book was better. <laughs> I mention that only because, as a writer, one tends to think the book is always better. But there's no question that it is the film, despite the success of many fine Indian writers. It's the film world that has really, really swept across the globe. Even the triumph of Slumdog Millionaire, the 2009 Oscars, both reflects and reinforces this trend. Because Bollywood's brand of glitzy entertainment has now gone well beyond the Indian diaspora in the UK and the US and places like that. It's gone to the screens of Syrians and Senegalese, um, of, of, of Arabs and Africans. In fact, um, a Senegalese friend of mine in New York told me of his illiterate mother, who takes a bus to the capital city of Dakar every month just to watch a Bollywood film. Now, she obviously doesn't understand the Hindi dialogue. Uh, she's illiterate, so she can't read the French subtitles. But Bollywood films are made to be understood despite such handicaps. And she enjoys the song and dance and action and, and, and message. And she can still catch the spirit uh, of the stories. And of course, she leaves uh, the theater with stars in her eyes about India as a result. I cannot count the number of African heads of state, foreign ministers, prime ministers, who have told me that the highlight of their growing up was looking forward to the arrival of the Bollywood movie in the nearest town. Um, Indeed, uh, it continues uh, to appeal across the, across the world. In the Arab world, I met a gentleman who owns, I think, all the five cinema theaters in Oman. And when I asked him what he showed, he said, mainly Bollywood films. And I said, oh, you must have a lot of Indians here. And he said, he said no, the audiences are 90% Arab. Uh, these films appeal to these audiences. Um, and indeed, an Indian diplomat friend in Damascus about a decade ago told me that uh, the only publicly displayed portraits in Syria that were as large as those of the then president, Hafez al-Assad, were portraits of the Bollywood superstar, Amitabh Bachchan. <laughs> it's possible that a new face has come in in that place, but that this, this message, I don't need to belabor the point. Uh, Indian films, Indian art, classical music, dance, all of these, uh, for that matter, fashion, Indian fashion design now increasingly striding uh, across the world's catwalks. Uh, and of course, Indian cuisine, which, which we've already made allusion to. Uh, the French have long known that the way to foreigners' hearts is through their palates, and the proliferation of Indian restaurants around the world has been little short of astonishing. I remember in my UN days testifying before the German Constitutional Court in the very small town of Karlsruhe, and I did well according to the government, they were very happy with me, so they decided to treat me to dinner, and they said, can we take you to an Indian restaurant? And there in the middle of Karlsruhe was an Indian restaurant. Of course, in Britain, the phenomenon is, is, is quite, quite, <laughs> Remarkable, because Indian restaurants here, or curry houses as you tend to call them, employ more people than the iron and steel, shipbuilding and coal mining industries combined. So the empire can strike back. 
Now, chicken tikka masala, that was your idea. I can tell you the story of chicken tikka, tikka masala from very reliable sources. When Robin Cook announced that, that was Britain's national dish, he was actually right because it was invented in Britain. The story goes that a bunch of drunken football hooligans walked into an Indian restaurant and demanded chicken tikka. And when this was served, they belligerently asked, where's the gravy? And as you all know, chicken tikka is a dry dish. Now, they were apparently too large and too drunk to be argued with. So the restaurant went back into the kitchen, opened the can of tomato soup, uh, poured it into the chicken tikka, microwaved the results, plonked it on the table, and said, this is chicken tikka masala. This was such a big hit that they came back and kept asking for the same dish. Then they started going to neighboring restaurants and asking why this wasn't available there. And so it spread. And thus, if you can buy chicken tikka masala in India, which now you can in some five-star hotels, you're actually eating an authentically British dish. <coughs> Anyway, but the point about globalization is that it's two ways and that, and that uh, Indian fears that economic liberalization will bring in some sort of cultural imperialism of a particularly insidious kind, that Baywatch and Burgers would supplant Bharatnatyam and Bhelpuri. I mean, that, that fear has clearly been allayed by India's own experience. And indeed, India's own imports of cultural products from the West has conclusively proved that you can drink Coca-Cola without becoming Coca-Colonized. Uh, indeed, the, the best metaphor for that, for, for that attitude, um, I think, was, was Mahatma Gandhi's more than 60 years ago, when he said he wanted India to be a house with all its doors and windows open so the winds of the world could blow through this house, um, because Indians are strong enough not to be blown off their feet by those winds. And our popular culture has clearly proved resilient enough to compete successfully with MTV and McDonald's, both in India and abroad. So from the export of Bollywood to Bhangra dances, India has now conclusively demonstrated with the chicken tikka masala story and others that it's a player and a source of globalization, not merely a subject of it. India increasingly benefits in its soft power from both the past and the future, from the international appeal of its traditional practices. Ayurveda, which is now spreading, almost catching up with yoga, which of course you can find a yoga center in every small town in North America, uh, all of this accelerating in popularity across the globe. I was in Colombia last year, and President Uribe said to me that he would love to see Ayurvedic centers established in Colombia. So there you are, uh, the, 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 the past coming to animate India's reach in the present. But so also is the thriving image of the country uh, in the 21st century, created by its, its diaspora. Uh, information technology, obviously, is a huge part of this change of image. Um, when I um, first went to the the States as a graduate student in 75, I think it's fair to say that the popular image of India was still dominated by fakirs lying on beds of nails, snake charmers with the Indian rope trick, mendicants with begging bowls stuck out, skeletal ribs asking for, for aid, and occasionally perhaps Maharajas on caparisoned elephants. Uh, today, all of that has long since been eclipsed by the image of the Indian as a computer geek or a software expert. Uh, thanks indeed to, to uh, Indians in Silicon Valley who have made the IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology, a brand comparable in every respect with MIT in America. Uh, of course, sometimes this has unintended consequences. A classmate of Rajesh has in mind told me the story of a major in history like, like myself of being accosted by an anxiously perspiring European at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam saying, oh, you're Indian, you're Indian, can you help me fix my laptop? <laughs> and the assumption is that, that every Indian must be a, a computer whiz or a software guru. But the fact is that in the information age, it's therefore not the side with the biggest army that wins, but the side which has the better story to tell. And India must remain the land of the better story. As a society with a free press and a thriving mass media, but the people whose creative energies are daily encouraged to express themselves in a variety of appealing ways, India has an extraordinary ability to tell stories that are more persuasive and attractive than those of its rivals. This is not about propaganda. Indeed, it will not work, in my view, if it's directed from above, least of all by the government, despite the presence in the government of stalwarts like Nambi. But, but its impact, though in intangible, can be huge. And the example I've often told, so forgive me those who've already heard this, but one I, I think is so striking is the, the, uh, the impact of Indian soft power in Afghanistan, a country with uh, absolutely vital national security interests of our country at stake, and indeed of all your countries, as I suspect as well. Um, but the Indian, the Indian impact in Afghanistan have nothing to do with a military presence because we don't have one. 
We've been doing a lot of soft power kind of work, connecting electricity at 3,000 meters height in Kabul, that's 24 hours of electricity, uh, building roads, uh, repairing and, and renovating girls' schools, uh, furbishing and, and running a maternal and child health hospital, even building that symbol of hope for Afghan democracy, the new Afghan parliament. But ultimately, the biggest clincher was that you couldn't call on Afghan at 8.30 in the evening for about seven or eight years till last year. And why was that? Because 8.30 was when the Indian soap opera, Kyunki Saspi Kabi Bahuthi, dubbed into uh, Dari, was telecast on, in Afghanistan on Tolo TV. And the fact is that no one wanted to miss it. You can't have scientific audience surveys in Afghanistan. You couldn't in those days anyway, and at least till, uh, uh, till, till recently. But uh, I can tell you that uh, the estimates that I read were that something like 92% of all television sets in Afghanistan were tuned to this one show. There were reports, not just anecdotal ones, but published reports of, of uh, attendance of religious functions diminishing at that hour, of wedding banquets being interrupted so that people would cluster around the TV and watch the show before returning to pay their attention to the, to the, to the bride and groom. Even of an increase in crime, because watchmen were busy watching this show rather than minding the store. And now one Reuters dispatch, I'm quoting a British source here, not an Indian news agency, a Reuters dispatch from Mazari Sharif a couple of summers ago, recounted how robbers in that town stripped a vehicle of every detachable part, the windshield wipers, the side view mirrors, the hubcaps, the spokes, the wheels, everything, and then scrawled on the windscreen in an allusion to the show's heroine, Tulsi Zindabad, long live Tulsi. And this is something clearly the Indian taxpayers can say as well, because there's India's soft power being projected without uh, so much as a single penny of governmental money being put behind it. Of course, official government policy can also play a role. And the former head of the Indian Council of Cultural Relations, my friend Paman Verma, has argued quite eloquently that India is culturally a superpower and that cultural diplomacy must be pursued for political ends. Uh, and that's why India is so highly visible at cultural shows around the world. And the ICCR is rather good at organizing festivals of India in assorted foreign cities. But I have to say, I'm not a fan of, of government propaganda because most people tend to see it for what it is. I believe the message that really gets through is of who we are, not what we want to show. So soft power is not just what we can deliberately or consciously exhibit or put on display. It is rather how others see uh, who we are uh, simply because we are being ourselves and they can see that. In any case, in today's information age, it's extremely difficult to completely control the depiction of who we are. People can see it for themselves and report it. So to take a totally different example of, of, of uh, unintended soft power, uh, I was elected as, as, as Joe Johnson was for the first time in the last general elections in my country, but five years previously, when I think you were a correspondent in Delhi, uh, the elections of 2004 in India were won by a political party headed by a woman of Catholic faith and Italian descent, Sonia Gandhi, who then made way for a Sikh, Manmohan Singh, to be sworn in as prime minister by a Muslim president, Abdul Kalam, in a country 81% Hindu. And this is not, I do not speak as a Congress parliamentarian, but in those days as a UN official who happened to be traveling in the Arab world and who was struck by the astonishment and admiration that my Arab interlocutors mentioned uh, when, they, when they read what had just happened in India. You know, we all applauded, of course, Barack Obama's election uh, uh, as, as, as president of the US, but it reminded us too that for 200 years, the world's largest and certainly the world's oldest second largest but oldest democracy, um, had not been able to elect a president or a vice president who was anything other than white, male, and Christian. So here was India, uh, a 60, not yet at that point, 57-year-old democracy, uh, producing this sort of result. Now that's, soft power, and it's not just therefore material accomplishments or, or cultural exports that make up soft power. Even more important perhaps are the values and principles for which India stands. Uh, after all, as has been mentioned, Mahatma Gandhi won India its independence through the use of soft power because nonviolence and satyagraha were classic users of no, soft power before the term was even coined. India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, was also a skilled exponent of soft power in developing a role for India in the world based entirely on its civilizational history and its moral standing, making India the voice of the oppressed and the marginalized against the big power hegemons of the day. And there's no question, if you read all of this in the 1950s, for example, that India enjoyed enormous standing and prestige across the world uh, and strengthened its own self-respect because it stood proud and independent on the world stage. 
But the great flaw in India's early approach in this area was that our soft power was unrelated to any acquisition of hard power. The humiliation of a military defeat by China in 1962 demonstrated that soft power has crippling limitations if you think of it alone in terms of national security. Instead of Theodore Roosevelt's famous maxim, speak softly and carry a big stick, we arguably spoke loudly and carried no stick at all. In those days, and in a tough neighborhood, the rhetoric of peace can only take you so far. Soft power becomes credible when there is hard power behind it. That is why the US has been able to make so much of itself power. A recent Indian history offers a somewhat mixed picture when it comes to the effective use of hard power. The 1971 war with Pakistan leading to the emergence of Bangladesh remains the preeminent example, but there are a few others. The repelling of Pakistani intruders from the Kargil Heights in 1999, the swift paratroop intervention in the Maldives to reverse a coup against the president in 1996, rare instances perhaps of hard power success. But against these are the examples of the 1962 China war, the spectacular failures of the Indian peacekeeping force in Sri Lanka in 87, which withdrew after incurring heavy casualties in an unplanned war with Tamil insurgents, and perhaps most disgraceful of the lot, the hijacking of an Indian Airlines aircraft to Kandahar in 1999, resulting in the craven release by our own foreign minister of detained terrorists from Indian jails. And of course, such incidents do not exactly enhance India's uh, credentials as a hard power nation. Uh, India is often caught in a cleft stick uh, when it comes to hard power incidents, particularly on its borders. It often treads softly in its anxiety not to come across as a regional bully, but in so doing, it emboldens those who are prepared to test it. As a result, it has been noticeably reluctant to evolve a strategic doctrine based on hard power. There is a sense in which most Indians still think that this would be unseemly. And that may help explain India's growing consciousness of its soft power. But I want to stress that hard power cannot become irrelevant, merely that its limitations are apparent, whereas soft power lasts longer and has a wider, more self-reinforcing reach. For China and Russia, kung fu movies of the Bolshoi Ballet will win more admirers internationally than the People's Liberation Army or Siberian oil reserves, even if in each case the latter is what the state relies upon. But of course, New Delhi knows that its soft power cannot solve its security challenges, for example, from terrorism. After all, an Islamist terrorist who enjoys a Bollywood movie will still have no compunction about setting off a bomb in a Delhi market. And the US has already learned that the perpetrators of 9-11 ate their last dinner at a McDonald's. To counter something like terrorism, there is no substitute for hard power. Hard power without soft power, however, stirs up resentments and enmities. Soft power without hard power is a confession of weakness. Yet hard power sometimes tends to work better domestically than internationally. An autocratic state is not concerned with having a better story to tell its own people, but without one, it has little, to, little with which to purchase the goodwill of the rest of the world. Whether it's the Americans in Guantanamo, the Chinese in Tibet, or the Russians in Georgia, it can in each case be said that a major military power won the hard power battle and lost the soft power war. Where soft power works in security terms is in attracting enough goodwill from ordinary people to reduce the sources of support and succor that the terrorists and other enemies of the state enjoy, and without which they cannot function. We can be proud of our democracy, our thriving free media, our contentious civil society forums, our energetic human rights groups, and the repeated spectacle of our remarkable general elections, because they are indeed collectively uh, what has made India a rare example of the successful management of diversity in the developing world. Uh, and it adds to India's soft power every time an NGO attacks the government uh, on a human rights issue, or somebody uh, marches against uh, government policy to, prevent, uh, to promote environmentalism or to fight injustice. It's a vital asset for us that our Indian press is free, lively, irreverent, often irresponsible, but that's another matter, and disdainful of, of sacred cows. But every time we let ourselves down in this area, as happened, for example, with reports of sectarian violence or the pogrom like savagery in Gujarat in 2002, uh, or there are nativist attacks on our freedoms within the country, such as uh, people attacking women drinking at a pub in Mangalore, as happened last Valentine's Day last year, then we have a setback to our soft power, because soft power will not and cannot come 
from the success of a narrow, restricted version of Indianness, uh, confined to the sectarian prejudices of some of the self-appointed guardians of Indian culture, the so-called votaries of Bharatiya Sanskriti. It must instead proudly reflect the multi-religious identities of our people. It must reflect our linguistic diversity, our contested history, the myriad manifestations of our creative energies. If we do that, if we are all of that, then I think we will maintain our true heritage in the eyes of the world. And that will mean acknowledging this battle in contemporary Indian culture between those who, to borrow Whitman's phrase, acknowledge that we are vast, we contain multitudes, and those who have presumptuously taken it upon themselves to define in increasingly narrower terms what is, quote unquote, truly Indian. I think my vision of Indian South Park certainly rests on the assumption that pluralist India will prevail, that it will always tolerate and promote and privilege plural expressions of its many identities and many points of view, and not allow the self-appointed arbiters of Indian culture to impose their hypocrisy and double standards on the rest of us, because if they do that, they are defining Indianness down until it ceases to be Indian. To wield soft power, India must defend, assert, and promote its culture of openness against the forces of intolerance and bigotry inside and outside the country. That ultimately is the India that is changing so dramatically. I'm sure Joe Johnson will confirm that during his years there, uh, he, he, he saw firsthand evidence that the cliche of India as a timeless and unchanging land, uh, if it ever was accurate, was completely out of date. Uh, what we now have and must maintain is a larger idea of India, one that safeguards the common space available to each identity and still manages to celebrate diversity. <coughs> I've written before uh, that if America is a melting pot, then to me India is a thali. It's a collection of different dishes on one stainless steel plate. Each dish is in a separate bowl and doesn't necessarily flow into the next. There you have your separate identities. But they all belong together on the same plate and they combine on your palate to give you a satisfying repast. That civilizational ethos is the immeasurable asset for India when we, when we talk about India's soft power. And I think from that, I have no doubt that uh, there can be the systematic development of a soft power strategy uh, by the government uh, to complement what India is rather than what it wants to show India as being. Uh, so far, such strategic advantages as have accrued from India's soft power, uh, goodwill, for example, amongst these African, Arab, and Afghan publics that I mentioned, has been a largely unplanned byproduct of the normal emanations of Indian culture. And such goodwill has not been systematically harnessed as a strategic asset by New Delhi. In fact, it's ironic that in and around the 2008 Olympics, authoritarian China showed a greater determination to use its hard power strengths to cultivate a soft power strategy for itself on the world stage. Of course, the good news is India will not need to try as hard, but it will need to do more than it currently does to leverage its natural soft power into a valuable instrument of its global strategy. And this is what your efforts in public diplomacy, Navneep, I think are, are marking a very encouraging beginning, but we still have some way to go. And I do want to stress again before concluding that hard power will continue to have its place in the world, but it's clear that the world's respect <coughs> will no longer be accorded merely to the strongest and richest countries. I'm going to wrap up here because, you know, like Egyptian mummies, we are all strapped for time. So I'm going to try and, try and bring this uh, to a conclusion by saying simply that those who tell the most positive ways of stories, those about whom the most positive stories are told for that matter, uh, will fare better in the global public's reckoning than those who win the wars. But remember the better story is not merely the story that can be told, it is the story that is heard and seen and repeated whether or not you are trying to tell it. And I believe that the India that has entered its seventh decade as an independent country is one open to the contention of ideas and interests within it, that's unafraid of the prowess or the products of the outside world, <coughs> wedded to the democratic pluralism that is India's greatest strength, and determined to liberate and fulfill the creative energies of its people. Such an India will tell stories that the rest of the world wants to hear and is glad to repeat, and that will offer it an inestimable advantage in the global mass media of our information age. Therefore, tomorrow's India truly can enjoy soft power, and that may well be the most valuable way in which it can offer some leadership to the 21st century world. Thank you, and yeah.